Good afternoon. Um, I wanted to first of all welcome everyone here. Uh, thank you for making the time to come out and uh, listen to our distinguished guests. Uh, also, thank you for those of you who are listening in uh, via live stream. Um, I wanted to begin by giving special thanks to New America's International Security Program and the Middle East Task Force, uh, who are responsible for putting on this event. My name is Adnan Zulfikar. Uh, I'll be moderating uh, today and moderating the discussion as well. Uh, as many of you know, the Syrian situation is now entering, has entered its fourth year. Uh, we are looking at uh, over 150,000 people killed. Uh, half the country has been displaced. And of that, about 3 million, or almost 2.5 million refugees. Uh, the situation has been described by the UN as uh, the great, greatest tragedy of this century. Uh, it's a humanitarian disaster. Uh, chemical weapons have been used. Starvation has also been a tactic of war. We now also see that, unfortunately, the Geneva peace talks uh, have netted very little results. And uh, word is that the UN Syrian envoy, Lakhtar Brahimi, will be resigning soon. So brutal air ca campaigns continue. There's a rise of extremist militias. There are many different topics when it relates to Syria. And so we're very, very fortunate today to have with us guests from the visiting Syrian opposition delegation. Uh, this is the first official visit of the Syrian National Coalition since uh, it was formed in 2012. Uh, we're looking forward to their insights, and I'm hoping that uh, the moderated discussion will lead us in many different directions. The format for today is going to be very simple. Uh, I'll be moderating a discussion for about a half hour with our guests. One additional guest will be joining us uh, a little bit late. Um, and then subsequent to that, we'll be opening it up for Q&A. Uh, there'll be a mic that'll be going around. So uh, the, I encourage the audience members to ask questions, but uh, to please wait until the mic comes to you so that uh, everybody can hear it. We're hoping that everything will be done by around 4 o'clock uh, in respect of your time as well. So just briefly, uh, if by way of introduction, uh, we have with us uh, Mr. Hadi al-Bahra, who is the Chief Negotiator and Secretary General of the Syrian National Coalition's Political Committee. He's also an advisor to the SNC's president. Um, we also have with us uh, Mr. Munzer Akbik, who is the Chief of Staff uh, for the Syrian National Coalition president. And a little later, we'll have uh, Ms. Reem Alaf, who is also an advisor to the president, joining us. So with that, let me uh, begin by sort of asking a very general question. Um, can you give us a, uh, an assessment, a brief assessment, of what's happening on the ground right now? Uh, what, as of today, what, what is the situation in Syria, and particularly in, in some of these major centers like Homs, Aleppo, Damascus. Sure. <coughs> Better to start from where fi we finished in Geneva. Sure. But you need to. Uh, your microphone is working. Uh, yes. Should be. Oh, sorry. Uh, so as you know, we have uh, attended and participated in Geneva conference with open mind and positive attitude, and uh, I look for achieving. Uh, political resolution to the crisis. Unfortunately, there we did not. We did not have uh, a partner. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Okay, now we it's working. So it's loud. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, the regime stra the regime strategy was just stalling and trying uh, not to discuss any really uh, serious uh, subjects in the negotiation session. We have introduced in Geneva uh, a roadmap to achieve a political transition out of 24 points. Uh, the regime refused to discuss it. Uh, the regime refused to agree on the agenda proposed by Mr. Brahimi uh, and refused 
about discussing the political transition in totality. So it was clear after Geneva that the regime only believes in a military resolution to the crisis. Uh, for the international community and to us, it was clear that there is no resolution and solution to the Syrian crisis except a political one. But also there is no political solution unless you press on the regime and change the ba balance of power on the ground, plus send clear messages to the regime that uh, following a military campaigns and using violence, extreme violence against the Syrian people will lead it nowhere, will gain it no more uh, legitimacy. And uh, the end result of this would be uh, to take this case to the World Criminal Court. Uh, <coughs> since uh, three months, the coalition and the Free Syrian Army has announced their clear position regarding the extremism, extremist organization, and terrorist organizations in Syria. And we had no choice but to raise a military campaign against them because they followed a clear strategy. Uh, instead of fighting this regime, they fought, instead of fighting the regime itself, they tried to liberate the liberated areas and gain the liberated areas from the Free Syrian Army uh, to force people into their own ideology and way of thinking. So since six months, approximately, we started waging a war against these, uh, and mainly ACES was the start. We were able to achieve some success in uh, the northern side of Syria, uh, but every time we succeed, they come back. And main support line of these uh, terrorist organization are coming from Iraq. Uh, other terrorist organization present in Syria are terrorist organization who are fighting with the regime itself. And they are uh, based, militias based on uh, religious extremism ideas. And they are participating in killing the Syrian people. So currently, uh, we find ourselves and the Free Syrian Army fighting a two front war. A war against the regime to win our freedom, dignity, and achieve the transition to a democratic so society. And another war front against extremism and terrorist organization. While in the same time, we can say the amount of help and aid from the international community stayed at the same level. We know that the US has did a lot in helping the Syrian cause. Uh, they are one of the biggest donors. They donated until now approximately around $1.7 billion to the Syrian people, which we carry with us our thanks and appreciation from the Syrian people to the, Syria, to the American uh, people and to the American administration. But we know also that the US is the greatest power and the greatest uh, presentation of democracy in the world. And this puts a big burden on its own shoulder. So we look for much more to be uh, given by the US and mainly achieving the political uh, solution. The humanitarian suffering, this is a growing problem and issue. Uh, now we have two and a half million uh, people, refugees. The UN expect that this number will rise to four million by the end of the year, and maybe it will increase more. So even the international community will reach a point where they will not be able to cope with these issues. So the fastest solution is finding a way to enforce a political resolution to the crisis. So now that we've opened the door with regard to the political solution, and I'll direct this to Mr. Munzer, uh, with Geneva having sort of stalled or failed, uh, and it's seeming that there's no political process in place, what 
potential political solution is the opposition looking for now? Are, is, are, we, are you looking to open up a new process? Or, or what is the political solution uh, that we can speak of? Uh, thank you. And thank you all for coming here and uh, participating in this event. Um, you know that the, the regime, Assad regime strategy from the very beginning was a crackdown. Uh, violent crackdown on the on the people in order to uh, back on their revolution. You know, it is like a slaughtering to submission, if you like to call it. Uh, they started with the shoot to kill policy, uh, facing the peaceful demonstrations, and escalated into um, all-out war against the population. As you can see that uh, there is nothing uh, the regime is not doing in terms of violence. Um, bombing the cities and villages, there are hundreds of them are completely destroyed now and people displaced about 10 million. Uh, about uh, 3 million uh, refugees in the neighboring countries and about 7 million displaced inside the country. Along with hundreds of thousands of dead and injured. This is all uh, Assad regime violence using all kinds of weapons, uh, artillery, uh, warplanes, uh, Scud missiles, uh, chemical weapons, everything. So you are facing here uh, a, a side who is only talking war and only doing war. But at the same time, you want peace. You want to achieve peace because people are suffering a lot from this war. But in order to achieve peace, you need that party, uh, the regime party, to cease fire. But they are not doing that. And they will not do that because what Assad wants is to keep ruling uh, the country. And uh, to get all the people except the continuation of tyranny, the same way it has been going for the past 50 years since Ba'ath Party coup in 1963. Uh, the Syrian people, as you can see, as, as everybody is seeing in the world, despite all the suffering and sacrifices, um, they are not backing on their revolution. They are continuing. There is determination despite all the sacrifices. So I don't think that uh, Assad can actually win militarily like he thinks he want to do. Um, the, the whole country becomes hostile to the uh, regime's forces. Uh, but at the same time, the fighters of the people are in a difficult situation. They are under-resourced and the firepower is still upper hand firepower with the regime. Uh, our weapons are much less in, in quality and quantity. So in order to achieve the peaceful solution, you need the other party to engage. Uh, the other party calculations are that they want to win and they can win militarily. And these calculations need to be changed first. I think that, uh, of course, you have the Assad regime is not alone. They have very strong allies that they are very committed, like Iran and Russia. So the calculation change should be also of those who are backing the regime. Uh, if, you, if you go back uh, in the recent history, 2005, uh, when uh, Rafiq Hariri, the prime minister of Lebanon, was assassinated by Assad, there were some credible threats at that time from the United States. And then he immediately pulled out his forces from Lebanon. And in recent, or recently also in, in last year, when he used the chemical weapons, there were also a credible threat of using force uh, by the international community and the United States. So immediately he handed over his chemical weapons. So we are now in front of a kind of 
thinking that can cooperate only under a credible threat or credible uh, use of force or when he thinks that it is be he has become in real danger on the ground, then this only will change the calculations of Assad. So I think that the, the way of reaching a political solution is Unfortunately, it has to start with military solution. At the beginning, we have to have advancement for uh, the Free Syrian Army on the ground. And this will require two things, uh, more resources uh, in arms, hardware, quality and quantity, and more organization of forces on the ground. And then when this advances happens, and when Assad realizes that he is not going to win this militarily, together with Iran and Russia, then I think they will come back to negotiating table. <coughs> so let me uh, turn a little bit. Uh, you know, both of you have used the term we uh, quite a bit. And one of the questions that uh, often is in the media in the West and, and around the world with regard to Syria and the Syrian opposition is, uh, you know, who is we? Uh, that uh, there, there are reports that it's a very fractured opposition, that there is a division between what's happening on the ground and what's happening outside of the country with the uh, people who are acting politically. Uh, could you shed some light and, and give us some insight on sort of what are the relationships at play uh, <coughs> within the opposition, excluding ISIS, mm -hmm. but you know, within the opposition, Islamic Front, FSA, all these groups, and what is the relationship between the people who are uh, acting militarily for the opposition and those who are acting politically? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> the Syrian coalition is uh, a coalition between political uh, forces, parties, and also um, local councils, which they manage the liberated areas. Uh, the revolutionary movement, the youth people who started the peaceful demonstration and so on. Also representation of the free Syrian army, which is the moderate part of the free yani, the armed movement. Uh, more than 50% uh, of the members of the coalition who are members who come and go inside Syria and go outside Syria, mainly in the liberated area, whether it's in the north or south. Uh, <coughs> so the representation, it represents the whole ethnicity of the Syrian people, uh, the whole religions of the Syrian people. There are Christians, Muslims inside, the, there's Druze, there's Alawite inside the coalition. Uh, also, <coughs> It's normal in democracy. You will we'll have different opinions about you know, reaching and achieving our goals. But you will not find any uh, split uh, in, uh, between among uh, the group in at about the main ideas about you know, getting rid of the regime, achieving democracy, and enabling the people to freely elect the General Assembly to rewrite their constitutions and choose their leadership. So it's fair, but also we cannot say that the whole Syrian people has elected the coalition because we are in a war situation. Mm -hmm. So the main legitimacy you have is uh, whatever you are seeking to achieve. Are these uh, representation, they represent the true wants of the Syrian people or not? Mm -hmm. And what we are seeking not to replace the Syrian people not to influence ideology and put specific political program on them. Our main target is enabling the Syrian people to freely elect you know, the General Assembly, rewrite their constitution, and freely uh, elect their leadership. We have an executive branch, which is the interim government, which was establi established by the coalition. The main purpose of the interim government is to provide services for the Syrian people inside Syria. We have an NGO, which is also uh, for humanitarian aids coordination. It's called the uh, Coordination Unit, the SEU. And their mission is to coordinate between you know, the donors and the people in need of services inside Syria. And we have the Higher Military Council. The Higher Military Council is a representation. They have uh, originally they are established with 30 members representing the 
mainly the civilian uh, forces inside Syria who carried arms to defend their families and their homes. So the three bodies, there is a coordination between them. There is a mechanism uh, where the military, higher military council is the council in charge of selecting their leadership and their commanders. They specify five leaders to the coalition. The coalition has to approve one of them. And uh, <coughs> there is a complete re relationship. Many people, they say, okay, why the whole coalition is outside Syria, for example. Uh, you know, the situation in Syria, it's not easy. Mm. And uh, moving inside Syria, Syria in total, the whole coalition, they will become immediately a target for the regime. Uh, recently, we took a decision that the coalition will be moving 80% of its presence inside Syria, leaving only its political arms and foreign relation arm outside Syria. The rest, they will be inside Syria. The interim government will be completely inside Syria. Actually, they started already their services inside Syria. But in order to do it successfully, we need to find ways how to protect the civilian areas where these offices would be located, because immediately they will become a target of the Assad Air Force. Mm -hmm. So we need to protect the civilian areas where their offices will be located in order to have them you know, effectively present on site here. Uh, let me uh, bring uh, Ms. Reem Alaf into the conversation. Um, you know, turning now to, uh, this is the first official visit of the SNC uh, to the United States, uh, the various meetings that you're having. Uh, can you give us a sense of you know, what message you're hoping to convey during your visit and, mm -hmm. and what you're hoping to take away? Uh, from the visit when you leave. Uh, you know, I know that uh, on prior to your arrival, there was a foreign mission status that was granted. Uh, you know, some felt that uh, it's not far enough in terms of diplomatic recognition, but, uh, you know, could you give us a sense of sort of the, the message conveyed and, and what's being hoped to be taken away? Absolutely. First of all, I'd like to apologize to everybody for my tardiness. We were in another event. Uh, I think there are several objectives to this visit to Washington and several things that the leadership of the coalition is hoping to gain. First of all, it is not about specific demands. We are asked often about what is the shopping list that we have uh, brought to us with us to Washington. I think what is more important for the coalition is to work on developing this relation with the United States, both at the level of relations with the administration, with lawmakers in Congress, with uh, the academic and intellectual and think tank circle, but also with American public opinion through the media. The point is that we believe we have long-term strategic interests together. Uh, we already know the administration. Our officials are often in contact with the administration. But it is this overture to the rest of the, um, of the segments of what makes uh, the decision-making process in America so interesting and important for us. Um, we hope that the image of the coalition, of the opposition, of the revolution in Syria, becomes clearer to the people in the US who don't have as much access to uh, events in Syria, who haven't had as much exposure to developments politically in the region or also political developments uh, on an international level. So I think that this is first and foremost what the coalition is hoping to, sh to achieve in Washington. It will not probably happen in a single visit. I think everybody believes that it is an extremely positive first step. It opens the door to more cooperation, to more communication. This is important for us, that there be more communication, that the American public gets to know what it is that's happening in Syria and not just um, get bogged down in very cliche titles that you might read in the media. Sometimes uh, there is no other choice but to have a simplistic title because we all under understand the constraints that publishers have. But we feel there's a lot more that you don't know about Syria, about what's happening there. You don't know enough about developments. You don't know enough about what the Syrian people are suffering, but more importantly, you don't know enough about what are the aspirations of the Syrian people, of the opposition and the coalition, which hopes to carry the voice of the people in Syria. This is, I think, 
probably the most important um, aspect of the visit to Washington. In addition, obviously, and I'm sure my colleagues have already covered that, in addition to the shopping lists, which we hope will be considered uh, positively. Um, Mr. Munzer, we, uh, uh, there's a lot of talk uh, about, uh, and particularly one of the most popular topics for Syria is uh, extremism, that there's a rising tide of extremism. And, and we've discussed uh, a bit of uh, the fact that you know, there's sort of these extreme militias on both sides. But with regard to the ones within the opposition, um, some people fear that you know, they're, they are not going to be able to be controlled, that even al-Qaeda right now can't seem to control uh, some of the more extreme ones. What, what solutions do you think, or is the SNC thinking about, and, and what do you think about sort of their potential role in, in a future Syria? Uh, how will they be handled? The extremists are not opposition. We are the opposition. They are stabbing the opposition in the back. They came in because the country uh, was because of the you know, regime bombing everywhere and using the army everywhere, eventually the country was open. Usually Al-Qaeda uses failed countries as, as an arena or, or safe haven. Um, at the same time, uh, Assad regime in 2011, 2012 committed a lot of uh, you know, massacres. And those massacres, they were videotaped uh, uh, with many women and children being slaughtered. And uh, these pictures, uh, Al-Qaeda used those pictures and videos as a recruiting tool to bring people in the fight. But the people who, are, who came, uh, there are some simple-minded simple uh, people brainwashed. They came in, but they are trapped. They, they fell in a trap. They found themselves not fighting for saving those people, but they are fighting just for their own agendas and projects of ideology of the extremism. And this is something that uh, the Syrian people uh, cannot tolerate and cannot accept and uh, poses a huge danger on us as a country and the future of the country. So that's why we started, uh, the Free Syrian Army started fighting uh, those extremists of ISIS uh, at the end of last year and uh, through all this time, about five, six months. Uh, we noticed that uh, they are also well resourced, one way or another. So, of course, you know that Al-Qaeda is a global, global threat. It's a global organization. So this is something that we need also to talk with the international community, that uh, these resources should be dried up. Why the extremists in Syria, they always have the money and the ammunition. And the moderate elements who are fighting the terrorists of Al-Qaeda and the state terrorism of Assad, they are always under-resourced. This is something that could be looked up, that should be looked up. For, because the future of Syria is for the Syrian people who are not, doesn't want neither Al-Qaeda nor the, uh, terror, the tyranny. The, for the future, I think that uh, the extremists will not have any future in Syria whatsoever. The society does not accept, the Syrian society does not accept those ideas and this ideology. But for the meantime, uh, we have to first get rid of the main <coughs> problem. You have now 90% of the violence in Syria is committed by the regime. All the heavy artillery, the warplanes, the tanks, the missiles, the scud everything is coming from the regime forces and he's using everywhere. So it's in order to solve the problem in Syria, it's like a train with stations. First station, second station, third station. So the first station is to get rid of that big danger and violence of the regime who caused all this chaos. And the second station, 
after you get rid of the regime and you reduce all that violence, then you need to deal with the consequences of what happened. And you need to deal with those armed groups who are there to prevent us from reaching the revolution goal, which is freedom and democracy. And those will be the extremists of Al-Qaeda and also the extremists and the terrorists whom the regime brought in, uh, Hezbollah and the Iraqi militias. They will be there also. They need to be dealt with. So there are so many things that need to be dealt with. And I am sure that the Syrian people can, uh, with a reasonable amount of time, clean the country from all these elements. But, the, but unfortunately, although that we are fighting them now, but in order for us to reach a decisive goal into clearing them completely from our country, first we have to uh, pass the first station, which is getting rid, getting rid of Assad regime. <coughs> so sp speaking along those lines, um, you know, we know that uh, there's an upcoming election that's going to be happening uh, where you know, uh, Bashar al-Assad is <coughs> planning to run, uh, and there are some other candidates apparently as well. Uh, how is the opposition approaching this election, uh, uh, you know, both sort of politically and, and sort of on the ground, and, and what are your thoughts uh, about it? For me? Please, yes. You know, uh, f from the basic, this regime is illegitimate. Uh, it took the power by force. It wasn't elected freely by the people. So whatever action it takes or comes out of it is illegitimate. Uh, <coughs> the issue is not the election itself. The issue is, are we going as an international community and as a human being, let a criminal committing daily crimes against its own people, against humanity, war crimes, are we going to let him go free? Mm. What message we, as a humankind, we send to our children, our society, that if you are so criminal and you can get away with it, we'll let you go? This mm. is the real question. Um, I want to ask one last question and open it up to the floor. Uh, you know, many people, uh, obviously, mm. watching uh, the Syrian situation have, have really bemoaned the fact that society, Syrian society, has been fractured and, and, and devastated in, in many respects. Uh, and then all this sectarian tension, all these different communities sort of uh, fighting with each other. As, as you look, and this is for Ms. Reem, uh, as you look to a future Syria, some people say, you know, th there's no way that Syria can return to where it was and, and the type of society it was. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? What are your thoughts on sort of, is there a way that to reverse some of the fracturing that has occurred, even if peace, this elusive peace, uh, does occur? I don't know why we always look at the situation in such a negative, with such a negative perspective. Yes, things have gotten a lot worse. Yes, things developed in a way which the revolutionaries had not intended. Yes, we have seen an increase in sentiments which we would have hoped would not have entered Syria. Syria, I remind you, is, uh, you know, it's very cliche to say, but it is true. It's a mosaic of different uh, religions and sects and ethnicities and nationalities. Uh, it's, it's one of the oldest, uh, you know, societies in, in, in the region, in the world. And I, I would like to stress that it is not the Assad regime which brought this peaceful coexistence to the people of Syria. We often hear nowadays that you know at least the Assads uh, protected the minorities or say you know this is absolute nonsense. There were minorities and majorities, or rather, there were different people of different religions and different backgrounds living in Syria for 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 time immemorial, without needing a regime or an authority to make sure that that peace remained there. Now, of course, today we are in a different situation. It would be absurd not to recognize that we do have now uh, sectarian tensions. These tensions were brought about by the Assad regime, by the fact that the group Hezbollah, which is considered a terrorist group in the US, 
was brought from the early days of the peaceful resolution before it turned into armed resistance, coming to lay claim on, for example, Sayyid Zainab, a mosque which is sacred to all Muslims, and saying that this is a Shia shrine that we need to protect from jihadis when there had been no such thing as jihadis and no such thing as armed resistance. Clearly, the introduction of that sectarian rhetoric from the regime was a magnet for, for the extremists from the other side who couldn't wait to come and lay counterclaim to, um, to their uh, rights to, to, to defend something. We, we are today facing a lot more tensions between the different segments of society in Syria. But let us not summarize this conflict or summarize the situation today as one which cannot be resolved because it's too late. Many societies throughout the world, in Europe, in the US, have undergone similar wars, which were even probably more devastating than what we've seen in Syria. We believe that once the cause of the problem is removed, we're not looking at it with rosy colored glasses, where nobody's telling you the next day everything will be uh, hunky-dory. But uh, we think that once the cause of the problem, of the cancer, is removed, once with the support of the international community, and we do need that support, we are able to eradicate these terrorist extremist groups, which we are the only ones fighting, it will take some time to rebuild. It will take time not only to rebuild physically, but to rebuild the confidence that the different segments of society had in their coexistence together. This predates the Assad regime. Please never believe what this propaganda tells you, that it is only the regime which protects this coexistence. It existed before it. It will take time. But with the vision that we in the opposition have to have a pluralistic, democratic, secular, civil uh, society and state where the rights of all citizens are protected by the state and by the constitution, rather than you know, um, talking about different segments. No, everybody will be a citizen. This is what we aspire for, and this is where we need help. We will need time to rebuild, but it will get there. Well, thank you very much. Um, we're going to open it up uh, to the floor now. Uh, just There's going to be a mic that's circulating. I'll point to you, and so we'll begin right here in the front. Um, but I, I wanted to encourage everyone to try to keep uh, the commentary to a minimum and really try to get to the questions so that we can field as many questions as possible. Please. Thank you. My name is Barbara Plett Usher. I'm with the BBC. Uh, President Jarba has made it quite clear that he, he would like the United States or the Western Allies to supply more significant weaponry, especially anti-aircraft missiles, to bring about this sh shift on the battlefield you've been talking about. In your visit here, have you sensed any softening of the US um, position because they're quite wary of that, as we all know. And secondly, I just wanted to ask, you mentioned moving the interim government into Syria, but there was an issue about protection. How are you planning to protect um, th those areas? Uh, I mean, uh, as far as I know, um, no-fly zones are no longer on, the, have never been on the table and still aren't. So how would you protect those areas from, uh, from air fire? Thank you. Protection of these areas by supplying the free Syrian army in these areas with the capability to defend the civilian areas against uh, air raids. You know, as you know, daily ba on a daily basis, there's these barrel bombs, which the regime targeting the civilian areas uh, heavily, especially in Aleppo area and Dara region. And uh, we need to find the solution to neutralize this type of weapons, take it out of the equation. And this is only provided if we provide the Free Syrian Army with the right weapon to defend themselves. And have you felt during the visit here any change in the position? We felt a uh, very common understanding uh, in the Congress, especially, and, uh, and the need to act on this to uh, protect the civilian people and civilian population. And we are hoping that the American administration would uh, look into it with a more serious look. Yeah. Uh, gentleman right there in the back. Um, Christopher Blanchard with the Congressional Research Service. Uh, given some of the remarks today about extremism, sectarianism, um, and the sort of balance of views within both the armed and political opposition, I was hoping you might comment a bit further uh, about both the, the armed and political opposition's relationships with uh, Jabhat al-Nusra and the Islamic Front. Um, 
both groups obviously routinely put out uh, direct messaging uh, uh, that contradicts completely the vision that you just laid out. And so I'm wondering, you know, does the coalition view some of those forces, particularly uh, Nusra and elements of the Islamic Front, as extreme um, uh, or not? Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Al Nusra is definitely uh, is a terrorist group that is part of Al Qaeda, uh, um, and uh, of course the coalition does not recognize them, and they do not, of course, recognize us. They call us infidels and they want uh, to kill us also. Now, uh, on the ground, uh, as you know that Al-Qaeda, there are two kinds, uh, there are two groups of Al-Qaeda on the ground. The ISIS, which we are fighting now, we fought and we uh, pushed them uh, from many areas like Idlib, Hama, uh, coastal area, and Aleppo, but they are still controlling Raqqa province and parts of uh, countryside of Aleppo. And these are very dangerous extreme elements, and uh, they, are, they are affiliated with Al-Qaeda, and they are also fighting in Iraq, as you know. Uh, so uh, these, this, is, this is the part, first part of Al-Qaeda. The other part, Al-Nusra, is uh, having a different behavior than ISIS, but uh, now uh, they start fighting the regime, actually. And now uh, we, there, are, there is now tensions between the Free Syrian Army and al-Nusra. There are tensions in uh, the south, in uh, Dara, and in uh, countryside of Damascus. And uh, we think that uh, eventually, <coughs> eventually they will be, uh, they will be uh, of course, uh, a huge uh, problem between the Free Syrian Army and al-Nusra because the Free Syrian Army is from the Syrian people and the Syrian people does not accept those extreme elements. But what is happening? What is happening is that uh, there are people, Syrian people, who want to fight the regime and who wants to you know, defend themselves. And they find certain groups who has uh, weapons, ammunition, they have the food rations. And sometimes they join those groups without uh, necessarily being uh, convinced with the ideology. That's why I think that we need to work on a plan, like uh, I just said earlier, that uh, the logistics of the extremists should be dried up, and this is, should be uh, an international collective effort. And the moderate elements, uh, logistics, and resources should be opened. And in this case, we can take all these uh, fighters to fight with the, with the moderate elements, and then the core diehards of the extremists then need to be dealt with uh, uh, and removed uh, from our country. Thank you very much. I, I am, excuse me, I have to leave for another event and my colleagues will take care of it. Yes. Thank you for joining Thank us. Thank, Thank you. you. It's Ilhan Tanır from Turkish Press. I have a quick couple questions, two questions. One is, uh, that uh, there have been credible reports that the uh, Assad regime has been using chemical weapons since the September, according to one report, 30 times and killed every single time uh, citizens. Uh, have you presented any tangible evidence to the U.S. administration here, or what's your case on that? And the second uh, question is that m uh, officials here, U.S. officials, are arguing that uh, Assad should go, but uh, the state institutions can be preserved. What's your take on that? Is it possible? Thank you. On the chemical war uh, weapon issue, as you know, the regime has handed out 92% of its stock, of its declared stockpile. We need to make a difference. Whatever they declared, they handed out 92%. There's 8% still in Syria, in the country. Plus, we claim that there is more than whatever they declared they have. This is very important. We need to follow on. Recently, the regime had bombed uh, so one area in Hama, Kafir Zeta, with uh, TNT barrel bombs mixed with the chlorine gas. Also, they used heavily chlorine gas with other type of bombs and bombing areas in the suburb of Damascus also. 
we have documented cases. Uh, we have sent these documents uh, to the core 11 group, actually not only to the US. Uh, there is an investigation team in Syria, I think, sent within the uh, scope work of the Security Council Resolution 2118. But still, they didn't reach a conclusion on their work. What was your other part, question? <laughs> this is uh, very clearly, uh, I mean, in Geneva, we have submitted a roadmap to achieve the transitional, uh, political transition. And it's out of 24 points. And uh, one clause of it clearly says that we are keen on preserving the institution of the states and restructuring them and improving their work and guaranteeing the employment of each state employee and employee in the country, even for security people who are not involved with the crimes against the people, they will be guaranteed to be employed by other branches of the civil government inside Syria. We are keen into protecting the rights of every and each Syrian in Syria. We are not, and we will put all our utmost effort not to repeat whatever mistakes has been done in Iraq, mainly. We will keep our institutions, and uh, we will keep the value of our uh, technical people, and even for people that who were with the regime, but really they were not committing any crimes or taking any action against their fellow citizens. <coughs> Thanks, Manar Ghunayem, Middle East News Agency, Egypt. Um, Mr. Monzer has just said now that the political solution can never be achieved except with the military solution first. So do you think that the coalition uh, can be able to carry out this fighting against both uh, Assad regime and against the uh, extremists? Uh, alone, or do you think that you uh, have to convince the U.S. administration to carry out uh, a limited strike at least to help the opposition? Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Should I have something? I, I don't think there's any question of anybody asking the U.S. or any other power to effect military strikes in Syria. <laughs> the only time that there was such a possibility, as you know, was after the chemical massacre. In, on August 21, 2013, when there was talk that the red line had been crossed, and you all know the story that it, you know, the president of the US asked for Congress to approve it, but then in the meantime, we had a deal between Russia and the US that OPCW would uh, get all the chemical weapons from the Assad regime. Since then, there has been no talk of a military strike. What we in the coalition say, when we, when we state that we are for a political solution, but in order to get to that political solution, we need these arms to neutralize the Air Force. Is th the process is the following. We think it's the Assad regime which believes that it can win this militarily because it continues to bomb. It continues to defy the international community, for example, with the elections, which is a slap in the face of the international community and of the core group because it is a direct contravention of the Geneva communique upon which based the Geneva peace talks or negotiations were held. The regime with every action and every declaration it makes is stating to the world and to Syrians that it has no intention to go to a political solution because clearly it thinks it can win uh, militarily. We think that if we were able to change this balance of powers on the ground and all we need to do in order to reach that stage is for us to have these anti-aircraft weapons in order to neutralize the monopoly on the air which the regime has. If the regime sees that the Free Syrian Army and the opposition are able to bring down 5, 10, 15, uh, 15 helicopters, which are throwing these barbaric barrel bombs now, including with chlorine gas, killing children and the elderly, if we can neutralize or at least convince the Assad regime sponsors, the Russians mainly and the Iranians, that this is as far as it goes, that the international community is now taking a stand to explain, to put forth that position that we're not going to allow this to get any worse. If we reach that stage, we think that this is the way 
to convince these powers that after all there is no other way than a political solution. This is why the coalition as the political umbrella of the Free Syrian Army is asking for those weapons, not for the sake of fighting to the end, but for the sake of convincing the sponsors of this barbaric regime that you will not be able to continue all the way militarily. You cannot win militarily. And by the way, when, when we read headlines that the Assad regime is winning, we also think that this is very misleading because what the Assad regime controls is basically this corridor between Damascus and now possibly Homs and the coastal area and the Lebanese borders. Had it not been for the full support of Hezbollah, of the Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guards, of the Iraqi militias, and of course, the military and, and political and financial support of Russia, how would Assad be able to continue holding on to power? The vast majority of Syria is not under the control of the Assad regime. It's either, either under the control of the opposition and the Free Syrian Army, or unfortunately some areas under the control of terrorist groups, especially in uh, Raqqa and in that area where ISIS has established the headquarters of its emirates. And this is what we're saying. We're fighting both of these terrors, which is the Assad regime and its terrorist groups, and the terror of extremist uh, jihadis. And we have still managed to make sure that Assad is not able to regain any territory it has lost. If we were able to neutralize the air power, we believe that quickly we could get its sponsors, the regime sponsors, to understand that the only way is political, which is what we have been calling for from the beginning. Uh, gentleman in the red shirt. Uh, Cameron MacDonald, um, High Point University. Um, I was wondering, uh, recently an Iranian regime has said that uh, they well, they declared victory due to a lack of weak U.S. response in result of the chemical weapons um, and enabling uh, the, high, the extremist Islamist terrorist groups. Um, I was just wondering, what is your reaction to that and what do you think of it? The Iranian. Yeah. The Iranian. Yeah. They recently, there was a report mm -hmm. that uh, 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 various Iranian policymakers have declared that uh, uh, you know the Assad regime has has won, and that mm -hmm. uh, and this is because the U.S. Uh, is not willing to do anything on chemical weapons and and. and yeah. Yeah. Well, as we know, the Iranian they uh, had some public announcement worse than this. They are claiming that this is their war and it's not the war of Assad and Assad just a tool in this war. And they uh, called Syria as one of their province from within Iran itself. And that's why now you find really uh, Syria, if you take it in legal terms, is an occupied country now, occupied by foreign forces, mainly by Iran. Uh, this morning, actually, I was talking to somebody who was still inside the government. And uh, he was complaining mainly that they have no say now inside Syria, that commands are given directly by the Iranian officers who are running and commanding even Syrian fighting units. And these forces are now are the trusted forces by the president of uh, uh, the regime itself. Bashar al-Assad, and he trusts no more any of the Syrians, even his immediate close circle. Okay, um, let me start with this gentleman here. Uh, Jack Greenblatt, Peace Now. Uh, I had a question about the reaching out to various constituencies in Syria, uh, obviously that are sympathetic or that are closer to the Assad regime. And of course, the most important would be the Alawite community, who, uh, you know, I do think a, a significant percentage of them are absolutely frightened of a, of a defeat by Assad. So, what are you doing to allay these fears and to try to reach out? That's uh, on various levels. Uh, the first level, which we made our roadmap and political program clear to all Syrian people. Uh, we declared in it clearly that we, the government, has the responsibility and the obligation to protect all its citizens. 
and to that all citizens they will have equal rights and responsibilities under the rule of laws and constitution. Second part, we have a program which we run uh, inside Syria, and we are in contact with many of the Alawite uh, part of party. And uh, now we feel that people staying inside Syria are much more helpful to our cause than leaving Syria and working from outside Syria. Uh, the, the whole Alawite family actually was taken as a hostage by uh, Bashar al-Assad himself from uh, even before, as uh, my colleague said a little while ago, before the revolution started to carry arm, when it was peaceful, the regime took a strategy. He knew that he cannot continue in power and stay in power unless he take the Alawite uh, sect all as a hostage. He knew they will not fight for him in person and for his presidency, but they would fight if he convinced them that their existence actually on the table. So immediately what they did, he put some you know, protection around the Alawite villages. He immediately put some videos on YouTube and uh, other media sources, uh, putting you know, very clear accent of people, soldiers committing crimes against Sunnis with an accent of Alawis. So he will strive on, you know, uh, raising up these issues. But we are sure we are sending clear message by our political program, by having a special, special programs inside Syria to support the moderate element. And as you know, there is permanent uh, Alawid uh, in the opposition right now, whether inside Syria or outside Hudson. Syria. Thank you, John Hudson of Foreign Policy Magazine. Uh, as you've acknowledged, uh, there's a two-front uh, war that the Syrian opposition has to fight, this, the moderate Syrian opposition, and that's the Assad regime and the extremists who are part of the opposition. This is a difficult question given the fog of war, but uh, I was wondering if both of you could provide some sort of an estimate of the size the extremists have in a pr the proportion of the opposition. Are the extremists uh, the majority, or are they the minority uh, within the opposition uh, to the Assad regime? Exactly. In order, let me <laughs> in order to get a clear picture, let's take it in different uh, uh, aspect. The whole armed movement on the regime side, opposition side, and extremist side, side all it amounts to less a little less than 6% of the total Syrian population. So it's a clearly, okay, we will not let 6% of the population to write the future of Syria. Out of this 6%, you take the regime forces out, and we take the opposition forces. The extremist forces, you are talking about, uh, if Al-Qaeda only, it's t less t than 10%. If uh, an extremist, say, or organization who try to fight, but they have their own ideology which they want to impose on the Syrian uh, people by using military means, then you are talking additional 20% of them. But the issue is the 10% of Al-Qaeda, they are strengthened by the government itself, by Assad uh, regime. Uh, when he uh, they carry air attacks, for example, they go attack the free Syrian army positions and leave ACES position out. They don't attack them at all. Within ACES, there is different groups. There is a group which fight the regime and fight us. Okay, and there is a group which fight us and doesn't fight the regime at all. So within each section, there is also, you can break them into different, but the common that they are well supplied, okay? And this is their main strength, and the main flow is coming out mainly of Iraq area. You have? No, I would have just added, I think uh, my colleague uh, answered your question, but I think uh, I would be very uh, weary of constantly referring to extremists in the opposition. This is a term we hear a lot. And there's, um, we're getting lost in, 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 in these 
with these terms. Who is the opposition? Who is not the opposition? Uh, the Free Syrian Army has been described by UN, UN Commission as the moderate nationalist forces. And we believe this is a very accurate description. In the Free Syrian Army, there is no room for the ideology of these extremists, which is why we generally do not like or do not believe that it is accurate to speak of extremists in the opposition. Al-Qaeda is not the opposition. And yes, there are a couple of groups which are much smaller in numbers. One of the, the somebody in the audience mentioned Jabhat al-Nusra. Jabhat al-Nusra, yes, are extremists and they are jihadis, but they are fighting the regime, but they're not part of the opposition, or at least they're not part of what we consider that big umbrella. So I just, you know, would really uh, appreciate. Uh, we we would really like to clarify these terms because we feel that this has contributed to the misunderstanding of what's going on in Syria when we just label everything as the opposition and consider that extremists and less extremists are, you know, lesser extremism are the ones fighting Assad. It's not really, I think, uh, accurate to put it that way. Well, what do you call Al-Qaeda then? They're, they're, they're not opposition. Terrorists. The point I'm saying, no, 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 the point I'm making, they're not opposition. Not terrorists. You opposition. said the extremist opposition. I'm telling you, Al-Qaeda is not the opposition. That's all I'm saying. So unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap it up there because we're over time. We, and he has, uh, uh, he, you're welcome to <laughs> greet them afterwards, but uh, you know, we're at 4.05, and I want to get everyone out. Uh, thank you so much for coming, uh, and I appreciate uh, you making time. And thank you to our panelists. Yes, thank you well. for having us. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you.